Hello, my name is Jacques Fremont. I'm President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Ottawa. I'm extremely pleased this morning to welcome you to this event, which is part of the 2020 edition of the Alex Trebek Distinguished Lecture Series. Today, we have the pleasure of welcoming the celebrated journalist and author, André Picard. Welcome, André. Whenever we gather for an important event like this, it is our custom to offer an indigenous affirmation in support of reconciliation. We pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. We acknowledge their long-standing relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. We pay respect to all indigenous people in this region, from all nations across Canada, who call Ottawa home. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. You Ottawa's Alex Trebek Distinguished Lecture Series was established seven, several years ago as a platform for encounters between influential Canadians and members of the U Ottawa community. At this point in the proceedings, I would normally have the pleasure of introducing the man whose generosity and vision made this series possible. Sadly, however, as you probably know, Alex Trebek passed away a few weeks ago. I'm proud to say that uh, I knew Alex. He was a kind, thoughtful, and most generous man. Alex Trebek was also one of our most beloved alumni at the University of Ottawa and one of our community's most passionate supporters. Over the years, he not only made significant financial donations to support new programs and new buildings, but he also returned regularly to see old friends and to make new ones. Through his gifts, and his visits, he consistently demonstrated his tremendous commitment to our community, to civic dialogue, and to the pursuit of knowledge. Alex spent many years sharing the right questions with the world on jeopardy, of course. It is fitting that his gifts will allow future generation of students at U Ottawa to continue asking the right questions and finding important new answers that benefit us all. And we are grateful to Alex. Like so many others, we will miss him. I offer his family my deepest condolences. It is now my pleasure to invite Jacqueline Nyman, Vice President, External Relations at the University of Ottawa, to introduce our guest speaker today. Thank you. Merci Jacques, and I thank you all for joining us today. Unfortunately, as a result of the pandemic, we can only be together virtually. Yet I'm nonetheless pleased to note that whoever you are and within, in whatever corner of the globe you may find yourself right now, we are all members of our globally connected U Ottawa community. We're here to listen to one of Canada's most preeminent journalists, André Picard. Welcome André. André Picard is, of course, a health reporter and columnist for the Globe and Mail, where he has been a staff writer since 1987, and he's also the author of five best-selling books. As Canada's most renowned health journalist, someone with a passion for public health, André's insights and perspective are of particular significance at this challenging moment in our history. André is an eight-time nominee for the National Newspaper Awards, Canada's top journalism prize, and he is a past winner of the prestigious Michener Award for Notorious Public Service in Journalism. And in fact, he was named Canada's first public health hero by the Canadian Public Health Association for his dedication to improving health care. André is also a graduate of the University of Ottawa, and we're proud to have our esteemed alum join us in this event. And I learned earlier today he was actually born on campus on Henderson Avenue. There you go. That's a U Ottawa born and proud alum. 
Andre will be heard in conversation today with Dr. Colleen Flood, who is University of Ottawa's Research Chair in Health Law and Policy and the inaugural director of the University of Ottawa Centre for Health Law, Policy and Ethics. And she's one of the co-editors of Vulnerable, the Law, Policy and Ethics of COVID-19. Feel free to download uh, a copy on the UOttawa Press website. And like Andre, Dr. Flood is passionate about public health and brings a wealth of knowledge to this topic. I am sure that we are all in for a fascinating conversation about some very relevant issues. And with that, I turn things over to you, Andre Picard and Colleen Flood. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vice President. And uh, uh, thank you to you uh, for joining us here today. And it really is my great uh, pleasure to be the MC of this event with the uh, incredible um, Andre Picard. Um, just before we start, I also want to note the passing of uh, Alex Trebek and to send uh, my condolences as well to his family and friends. Um, but it's a, it's a great way to honour him, I think, to have uh, Andre Picard here with us today. And, and wel welcome and thanks for coming, Andre. Well, thank you. Uh, hopefully you'll give me the answers and I'll be able to get, give you questions uh, yeah. in Trebek fashion. No, no one's given me a loud buzzy, buzzy button, but uh, I, I might ask for that later. Um, when we were conceiving of this, uh, we were, you know, really the only thing that seemed to be that we could talk about was COVID-19. And I, and I believe that you actually came up with the, the title for this event, like Life in the Time of COVID-19. And we thought we might just actually start with that. So as, you know, as, a, as a person, as an individual, and as a public health journalist, what has this meant for you, Life in the Time of COVID? Well, you know, it's really an unprecedented time, the first real global pandemic in a century, and we've learned a lot. Uh, we've been forced to learn a lot. Uh, we have have to change how we parent, how we work, how we live, how we interact, mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to have an impact for a long, long time to come. So it's going to be a, a real challenge for all of us, and for a journalist, journalist in particular, someone who specializes in health, it's been a real eye-opener, and it's, you know, sort of the story of a lifetime. So we're maybe, as journalists, unusual in that maybe we're the only people on earth who are benefiting from this in some strange way. Mm -hmm. But it's a, an important time. I think it's reminded us how important information is, how important good science is, how much uh, good science journalism is important. So I, I, I feel it's a special time and I have a, a little bit of a contribution to make to it. Well, you've absolutely been the right man in a bad moment. Uh, bringing, you know, your skills and expertise uh, to benefit many Canadians from coast to coast. And I'd be remiss not to thank you before I forget to do that, because I think it has been really invaluable. So what the kind of questions that we're going to ask today are sort of grouped in three bunches. So we thought we would start with um, what we've learned uh, and then uh, where we are now and then what the future might hold. Uh, and at the end of that time, uh, we'll have some time for questions uh, from, from, the, from the public and from faculty and others at, at the University of Ottawa, if that's okay with you, Andre. So, yeah. so that's how we're going to rock and roll with this. So the first um, bunch of questions are, what have we learned so far? Uh, and, you know, this is really the toughest question, I think. Um, how have we done... How has Canada done? Um, what, have we, what have we done well? What have we done badly? You know, how has Canada performed uh, in response to COVID-19? Yeah, I think it is, it is really the toughest question because hindsight's always 2020. So could we have done better? Absolutely. Could we have done worse? Probably. We just have to look to the US to, to learn that we could have done worse. But I think overall, unfortunately, Canada's response has been kind of fair to Midland, kind of in the middle. And it's in some ways, it's, I think, a reflection of the Canadian character. You know, Canadians are very cautious or slow to act. And in a pandemic time with a, a virus like this that moves quickly, you really have to move fast and forcefully. The countries that have done best have done that. They've really you know, not hesitated an instant. And Canada's had a lot of hesitation and we've paid for it. Uh, the other problem that we have is more of a, 
uh, structural one. Uh, all our problems in healthcare, I think, are structural and they were exposed by this pandemic and that we have these 13, 14 different jurisdictions doing things differently, sometimes at cross purposes. Again, that slowed our response. It made the, the outcomes worse. Uh, the, the, the other thing that I'd say that's really important that the pandemic exposed is uh, weaknesses in our society that already existed. Mm -hmm. And this virus has really acted at this giant magnifying glass on, on, on failings in society, like homelessness, the treatment of the elderly, uh, you know, the way we uh, support uh, racialized workers, you know, low paying jobs. All this stuff has become the big, big problem in the, in the pandemic, even worse than the virus itself. And I, I think that the flip side of that, it's, it's all an opportunity to fix these things that have been exposed in, a, in an awful way. Mm -hmm. um, and so we talked about Canada as one clump, you know, of responses, but there's actually been quite variable responses from province to province and even within provinces from municipalities to municipalities. So do you want to comment on some of the variation we've seen and what can we learn from that variation inside of Canada? Yes, I think there's obviously some clear uh, variations. Uh, Quebec was hit first, it was hit hardest, so it had a little bit of bad luck. You know, it just had an earlier March break, a lot of virus came back from the U.S. with uh, travelers, Quebecers love to go to Florida. So there's some bad luck there. So it really took off there in Ontario right after. And the West was really spared in the first wave. And now we're seeing the West uh, having a real terrible time, uh, much worse uh, than the first wave. So I think the, the really sad thing to me is how the, the jurisdictions that weren't hit hard didn't learn from the, the mistakes that were made in Ontario and Quebec. And again, that biggest mistake is you really have to crack down hard. Uh, when you shut down, you can't have a, a semi-shutdown. And I think again, in Canada, in every jurisdiction we've done this, we've kind of, we never really locked down, we kind of semi-locked down. So a Canadian lockdown is what? Is you are locked down, but you can go to the grocery store 10 times a day and you mm. can go and see your friends. We've never really locked down and that's why our, our, our outbreak or our pandemic, our Canadian pandemic has gone on for so, so long and, and keeps getting worse. Mm -hmm. So uh, while we're just on that point, I just thought we might, you know, focus that we, we did have some um, outstanding efforts at, at, at municipal levels. Like I'm, I'm thinking in, in Kingston of the response of the local medical officer of health there to uh, the risk of infection in, in long-term care homes. But other examples of this across the country where we seem to have, you know, what we would hope to have uh, are people doing a great job, but no scale and spread. Do you, can you comment on that? Why, why couldn't we take, because this, you know, this example from Kingston happened very early on, it was a clear example. Why couldn't we scale that up and spread that out, not just to Ontario, but to other provinces? Well, it's really, it's the story of, again, of Canadian healthcare, right? We f resolve everything on a small scale in a pilot project, and then we never scale up. So we had lots of success stories during uh, COVID, uh, Kingston was a good example, a really good local health officer who acted forcefully and smartly. We have the Atlantic bubble has been pretty well a really good uh, example of keeping the, the virus contained and allowing the economy to come back. Uh, we've had fabulous communicators like Bonnie Henry in, in, Albert, in uh, British Columbia. So we have all these examples and the, your question is a good one. Why don't we learn from them? And I, I don't know why. This is a, a question that's troubled me for decades in Canada. Why don't we scale up our successes more, more readily and more forcefully? And it's really something I wish we would do more of, a lot of sharing of knowledge and learning from each other. There's so much uh, good stuff done in Canadian healthcare and during the outbreak, and we just don't tap into it enough. Okay, well, maybe we'll come back to that question again, because I think it's, it's key to, you know, uh, what we do now and how we go forward from here. And, and what we learn from all of this. Um, but speaking of different kinds of lessons, obviously uh, Canada is not alone in facing this pandemic in the world. Um, we did have actually some time, even Quebec had some time because we saw what was happening in Wuhan and we saw the bodies piling up in Italy. So we did have some time that you know we were lucky in that regard. It didn't hit us first. Um, 
And we've seen, you know, a range of different responses from different countries. It's actually quite hard to unpack it all because everyone's doing a bit of everything. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? What can we learn from, what should we have learned? What have we learned from other countries? Were we good enough at doing that, of pulling out um, exemplars from other jurisdictions and acting quickly on that evidence? Yeah, I think again, it's hard, you know, it's easy retrospectively, but we know who's done well. China has done well, New Zealand, Australia, Taiwan. And what have they done differently? Again, it comes back to that acting forcefully, uh, not half measures. So I think that's the important lesson we didn't learn. The other one, though, is you have to be careful. Things cannot always be translated directly. Uh, culture matters a lot. And the Canadian culture I spoke about at the outset is very cautious, go slow. I think it's fair to say that Canada, like much of the world, didn't take this as seriously as it should have uh, from the outset. Oh, well, this is just China. It's another flu. It's right. no big deal. It'll pass. So a lot of that was we squandered the opportunity to act. Uh, then what happened in Italy should have really been a wake-up call. And we said, well, it's Italy, chaotic government. They're not organized. We're much better than that. So I think we allowed ourselves to be lulled into doing nothing for a long time. And then we had our regional differences. Well, it's just Quebec. We don't have to worry about this in Alberta. So mm -hmm. all these things kind of just build on each other and they, they result in a long-lasting disaster, unfortunately. Right. Um, we've seen that most of the bodies uh, from resulting from COVID-19 are in long-term care homes. Um, and, uh, and we know that you've got a new book coming out about long-term care, not just about COVID, but about long-term care. I wonder if you want to comment on, uh, on what we should have done better um, with respect to long-term care homes and how could it be that we were so focused on some aspects of precaution that we somehow missed the ball completely on long-term care homes? Yeah, I'll try to keep this one to under an hour as an answer, <laughs> but uh, I think a couple, of, a couple of really key points. It's one, we can't overstate the, the dramatic tragedy that has occurred in our long-term care homes. We've had approximately 12,000 deaths in Canada overall, and more than 9,000 of those have been our elders in care. So that's a failure of immense proportions that mm. I, I think can never be uh, forgiven. To, to be honest. So why did it happen? I think it happened for a couple of reasons. One is uh, we don't value the elderly. We don't value our elders near enough. Uh, we have systemic issues. In Canada, we did a fantastic job of protecting our hospitals, but we did a terrible job of protecting long-term care homes. Mm. These homes are essentially cruise ships on earth. They are perfect uh, environments for the spread of illness. So early in the pandemic, you may recall, we were all obsessed about cruise ships. Yes. But these are, you know, we have hundreds of these cruise ships on land in Canada, and we did nothing to protect them. The workers didn't have PPE, they have inadequate staffing, uh, people live four to a room. Uh, these are in many ways worse conditions for the spread of illness than, mm -hmm. than ships or our prisons. And we just didn't take that seriously. And that, again, it's really inexcusable. Everyone with even the most basic knowledge of, you know, epidemiology 101 would know this is the place where bad stuff is going to happen. Whether it's the flu, whether it's norovirus, whether it's coronavirus, whether it's food poisoning, these are places that are just ideal for the spread of illness. Why did we not act? I, I think, sadly, it just comes down to ageism when we get right down to it. Mm-hmm and gender and disability and very very much all very much this isms. is a, yeah this is very much a gendered pandemic right mm -hmm. and especially so in long term care almost everyone who lives there are women because women live much older uh, tend to be single when they're older uh, all the staff are women almost exclusively uh, the caregivers the people who have taken care of them before they're too sick and have to go into home are all women. This is very much a gendered pandemic. And then you add the disability aspect to it. For some reason, we actually don't think of uh, elders with chronic illnesses as dis disabled. We think of that as a different community, but they are part of that community. Another community that's terribly neglected financially, socially, uh, morally, ethically, you name it. So yeah, yeah these are, are fundamental issues. Okay, well, you know, I feel like a bit Debbie Downer asking about what we should have learned. So let's turn to where we are now. 
um, and thinking about uh, your core mission as a communicator, um, how important has communication been uh, both in managing the pandemic and, and now go forward strategy from here? Yes, I think communication without question is the number one tool that public health has in its toolbox, yeah. right? It doesn't have a lot of magical medicine. It has communication. It has to convince people to do the right things. Overall, it's done a pretty good job. Our public health in Canada, we have some gifted communicators. You know, we often name Bonnie Henry, but we can talk about uh, uh, people in, you know, Alberta, Dina Hinshaw, et cetera. Yeah. And again, public health is all about women, women leaders, uh, commuting in with the public and telling them, listen, you have to wear your masks. You can't get together in groups. Sorry, I hate to break, be the Grinch, but we can't have Christmas this year. Yeah. Those are all really tough messages to deliver, but they are the most important protections that we have. Have. Uh, we have a vaccine coming, that's exciting, but all the fundamental stuff is way more important and it remains so to this day. So, uh, I mean, we talked a little bit just before about how other jurisdictions uh, acted fast, more coherently, more directive. You just mentioned here that the primary job of, of public health officers has been persuasion. Do you think they should have used more direct tools? more direct orders, more clear laws and regulations, as opposed to relying primarily on suasion? I think, again, it comes back to culture. I think Canada is more of a culture of, of suasion than hard-hitting laws. You know, we're not Singapore. Singapore, you know, everything's about the law. It's very yep. rigid. So we have to adapt to our culture. I think, the, I think though, that we could have been harder, but again, we have structural limitations, right? Our uh, public health officials are respected. We name shoes after them. We draw, you know, lovely murals of them, but they don't really have any power. So I think the problem is our public health officials need to be much more independent. Mm. Uh, in the countries we have independent public health officers, again, they did better because they can act forcefully. So they have our, our public health people really have to walk this fine line because they're bureaucrats and they have right. to listen to the politicians. Again, I think the jurisdictions that did the best in Canada are the ones where the politicians had the good sense to step back and right. say, listen, you're the expert. And I, I think of British Columbia, you're the expert, Bonnie Henry, you tell us what to do and we'll listen. Right. Where we got right. political meddling, Ontario, Quebec, things went much more badly. Okay. So when you're in the art of suasion or persuasion, um, part of the problem is who is listening to you and their innate beliefs and preconceptions and biases. So here, you know, I think um, relative to south of the border, we're doing reasonably well on the conspiracy theory frontier, but we still have, you know, anti-vaxxers, uh, people who think that COVID is, you know, an overrated, um, over-exaggerated phenomenon. Uh, and so forth and so on. H how do we, you know, how do you think we do, how does Canada do on this kind of science metric of capacity to understand science, to be, to receive messages from public health authorities? How, how are we on that frontier? I think we do relatively well. As you mentioned, we do better than the US, which isn't saying much. <laughs> but I, I think it's really the challenge of modern times, right? It's how do you communicate? There's no public anymore. There's publics, plural. Yeah. They're very, very different and they're very segmented. And you can really lock yourself in your bubble, your Fox News bubble, mm -hmm. and believe the worst conspiracy stories on earth and have them people say, yeah, you're right, over and over. So it's really, really difficult to communicate in these times. I think Canada has done well with this general message, which is the hard, you know, hard one to deliver. I think where we've fallen down is not so much in explaining science, but in speaking to specific audiences. Uh, young people, I don't think mm. we've done a good job of uh, communicating to young people, You know, using thing, tools that they like, like TikTok, I think have been underused. We haven't done a good job of communicating with racialized communities. The South Asian community in Canada has been really hard hit. The messaging hasn't been tailored to them. These are people who work. They don't have any choice to stay at home. You have to have a different message, uh, different ways of helping them. So I think we have to get more sophisticated. Public health, they're nice people, but they're very conservative, small c, uh, very old fashioned. You know, the way we teach public health to this day is still very, almost like a religion. We're going to tell right. you good things to do and please do them. Right. 
and we have to we have to change that. We have to adapt to the the internet age. Okay, so so the p public health folks need to modern up. Uh, as we're in the, this, uh, you know, second wave, whatever you want to call it, basically the next burst of um, infection and death, and we do have the, you know, the possibility, well, not the possibility, the uh, salvation, hopefully, of vaccines on our near horizon. But what now could and should individuals be doing? Um, what should, you know, the ordinary Canadian at home the U Ottawa alum be doing right now? I think we should actually, people don't want to hear this because Christmas is coming, but we should be redoubling our efforts to do the old fashioned stuff, to stay right. away from people. That's the number one thing. Limit your contacts with other people. Uh, all the sophisticated messaging comes down to that. Yeah. Have the fewest contacts possible. When you do mask up, uh, don't get into large groups, get outdoors as much as possible. We know how this virus spreads. It spreads indoors in close contact, prolonged contact with people. So that's what you try and limit. Uh, and I think to give yourself hope, you say, listen, there is hope on the horizon. The yeah. vaccine is going to help us break those chains of transmission, but it's going to take a while. Uh, the average U of O alumni is going to be a pretty healthy person. We're going to be last on the list uh, for getting the vaccine. Uh, you know, I tell people I'm going to be among the last to get it, and I'm proud of that. I'm healthy, and I'm willing to wait. I really want 90-year-olds in long-term care to get the vaccine today as they've started right. getting in Britain. We have to have to do the people at risk first. So just while we're on this subject, uh, you know, we, we're talking here about speaking to the individual and individualized messaging, and I've seen quite a bit about, you know, assessing your individual risk and this idea that you know you have to persuade people, so by necessity you're sort of talking to the individual. How do we sort of square that circle with the fact that a lot of what we need to do, when it's you or I, relatively wealthy people um, uh, with good jobs and and so forth, what we really need to do is not so much for ourselves or our immediate families, but for others, for the workers in long-term care, for the people that are living there. How do we get people to look up and out um, about their impact on others? I think the key is, and, and this is your expertise, you know, your expertise is law. In law, we have responsibilities uh, as well as rights, right? So we keep talking about the rights. We have the right to work, et cetera, but we have responsibilities. We have responsibilities to others, not only our immediate family, but to people yeah. around us, to our society. And I think that's what it's about now. People are saying, yeah, you're asking me to make sacrifice. Yes, absolutely I am. But there's a lot more people doing a lot more sacrificing than us. People yeah. working in our stores, uh, delivering our food. The most amazing thing about this pandemic is nobody's going hungry. Uh, our store, you know, shelves are stocked. We had a little toilet paper uh, panic early on. Don't forget on. the flour. Uh, and that the flour, you know, we had these little but they reminded us just how easy we have it. Yeah. And I think those, we know who's getting infected. It's people doing the, the grunt work, doing, keeping us yeah. in a relatively easy state. Uh, this is a pandemic like no other. We haven't suffered very much. So those of us who are privileged, uh, who can work from home, uh, who can mask up, who can go out to, to the grocery store 10 times a day, we have a responsibility to step back and say, no, I'm not going to do it 10 times a day. I'm going to do it once a week. Yeah. And I'm going to do it, why? To protect the workers, to protect my grandmother, mm -hmm. protect my neighbor's uh, child who's in a wheelchair. Th this is why we have to do this stuff. So as Christmas and other holidays are coming up, um, we've seen a, a, a number of different stances from from governments about what should and shouldn't be happening for this uh, holiday season. And, and uh, as we already mentioned, varying responses from um, Alberta, Quebec, and so on, Manitoba uh, having problems now as well. Uh, the Atlantic bubble has burst. Um, so at this period of time, what would you say governments should be doing, public health officers and governments? What should be the what should be the uh, gold standard response right now? I think the gold standard response has to be a little bit of sympathy, a little bit of empathy. Uh, we know you really want Christmas and you're going to have many more good Christmases in the future, but this, this one, sorry, it's off the table. 
you know, sort of like a, almost like a wartime message. In the war, people didn't get together. There was a lot of uh, sacrifice, personal, uh, community-wise, and it was done for the greater good. And I think that's the point where we're at. We're sort of in this, I think, a Churchillian period where this last, you know, sacrifice until uh, the, the light of the dawn of day or some not to be too poetic about it, but I think that's where we're at. I have to just send this message that we understand that you don't want to miss Hanukkah and you don't want to miss Christmas and you don't yep. want to miss the other holidays, but just do it just this once because it's going to pay off. Mm -hmm. Do you think there is uh, COVID fatigue? Because while I c completely agree with your message, we were told that as well for Halloween you have to be good for Thanksgiving so that we can have Christmas and other holidays, Hanukkah and so on. And now here we are, and that's not happening either. Um, do you think that there's been enough, um, or how can governments get more transparent with the public about the fact that previous messaging might not have been perhaps what it should have been? Yeah, so I think there's no question there's fatigue. There's widespread fatigue. We're all sick of this, no question. Uh, it makes the messaging harder. Uh, yeah, we got this same message at Thanksgiving, but the, the reality is we didn't listen to it. We had massive gatherings at Thanksgiving and we paid for it. So I think if anything, we should learn this lesson. Uh, we didn't listen quite well enough in the past. This is our chance. And, and I think what's different about the messaging now is there really is, it really is a more hopeful time. Right. Uh, we, you know, when at Thanksgiving, we're still talking about if there'll ever be a vaccine. And now it's not an if anymore. Now there are at least three vaccines or probably be a dozen uh, within the year. And we're going to be getting into, you know, large segments of the population by the fall, by the summer, by the fall in Canada. A lot of people will be vaccinated. So there is hope on the horizon. So you just have to hang in there. Hmm. Um, okay. So we will shift now to our uh, third and final sort of set of questions, which are, uh, we're hoping a, a more uh, optimistic, huh? uh, looking looking to the future. So, you know, my, my primary question is, will I still get to sit in my pajama bottoms with my suit top on doing Zoom after Zoom? Um, what, what will our society be like, uh, do you think, Andre, in a year's time? Yeah, so I think those are big questions. I think there's a lot of things that have changed that we don't know if they're going to change forever. Uh, some good ones, so I write about healthcare. I think one of the best things that come out of this pandemic is digital health. Yeah. Uh, we've made a decade's worth of progress on digital health in a few months. Too sweet. Uh, before mm -hmm. this uh, pandemic, 1% of clinical consults were done online. Now it's 50%. Yeah. In some hospitals, it's 90%. That's a great, that's a that's a good thing. So yes. we got to latch on to those good things. Uh, will you be able to work in your pajamas? Maybe. I, I think the workplace is going to change fundamentally. We've learned that we don't all have to get in our cars and drive to downtown in a big city to be efficient. Uh, so I think, you know, I think our cities are going to be remodeled. We've uh, hopefully everybody has a bike now, which is great. Mm -hmm. But let's keep the, I think what we have to, the real key is to not give up on this stuff, to say, hey, let's take the good things and perpetuate them forever. Because they, you know, our cities are less polluted than they've ever been because people aren't commuting. So let's, let's cash in on these good things and not just remember the bad ones. Mm -hmm. And far fewer car accidents and injuries and emerge emissions as a result of less traffic on the road. But there are costs and consequences with all of that. Um, various people's jobs depend on, you know, cars and roads and, um, and you know, downtown restaurants and services and all of these kinds of things. So there'd be a lot of dislocation if we stay, you know, in our current paradigm. Do you really see that as being what will, that we will radically shift or will there be some more minor modifications that might be made over yeah. time. Yeah, so I'm not a futurist, but I think, yeah. I think there will, I hope there will be a lot more, mo a lot of modifications. Mm. Uh, you know, everybody talks about going back to normal, yeah. but the normal wasn't that great, right, for a lot of people. No. Uh, this sitting and commuting is just one example. 
uh, we can do things differently. We can have a more digital life and not be zoomed out. We can find, I think, I think that the key of coming out of this is finding the balance, hanging on to the good stuff that's happened and getting rid of the bad stuff. So the bad stuff being on Zoom 12 hours a day, I hope that doesn't continue. Yeah. But maybe being on Zoom three hours a day and going for a run at every lunch because you've gotten into that habit, maybe that'll yeah. be the normal now, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, we hope you're not over Zoomed as you're listening here. Um, I'm, I'm sure that we could just, you know, do this on repeat. Uh, so, you know, the, the great hope, uh, uh, as you've mentioned, that the thing to cheer us all up is the uh, vaccines that are almost here. Many issues around vaccines, um, the distribution of vaccines, the allocation of vaccines. Um, is our vaccines... Um, this great salvation that we've sort of hinted that they are, um, will they really be? And what, what will happen? As the, as the vaccines are starting to arrive and they start to roll out, what will happen like, for ordinary people? How will it work? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's really exciting science, but there's a lot of unknowns. So we just don't know things like, will the vaccine last forever? So I think we have pretty good data that's going to be safe. So that's really important. Uh, we have pretty good data that's going to work. So it's going to stop people from being infected. But what we don't know is, will they still be infectious? So can they still pass it on? So we still have to wear our masks, even if we're vaccinated, till we figure this stuff out. So a lot of scientific questions unanswered. Uh, the distribution uh, the logistics is a gigantic puzzle, unprecedented again in a century. How do you vaccinate 37 million people in Canada, 7 yeah. billion around the world? So these are real challenges. So there's going to be a lot of hiccups. There's going to be a lot of bumps in the road. Uh, I think what's really key is for people to keep their eye on the ball. You know, that's the goal is to get everybody vaccinated eventually and don't get hung up in little, you know, there's going to be little breakdowns here and there, etc. So what, what can the ordinary person, so-called ordinary person, look forward to? I think is a vaccine on the horizon for, you know, unless you're a really high-risk person, like a, a healthcare worker on the front line, a person living in a long-term care home, a, a caregiver uh, to someone who's uh, an elder. If you're, just, if you're not in that group, you're probably thinking the spring the summer, fall, you may get a vaccine. And by then we're gonna know a lot more. We're gonna know if, yeah, maybe we don't need two shots. These vaccines now are two stage vaccines, but there's growing uh, evidence that maybe one shot will do it. So that'll mm -hmm. be good news. Uh, what are we looking forward to, uh, to our, what can happen practically is we may have these immunity passports, right? Mm. This is talk, uh, you've been vaccinated, so you're going to have a passport to show that it's going to allow you to travel. It's going to yeah. allow you to go back into your workplace, et cetera. So there's going to be different stratification of people in society based on how immune they are. We're going to learn more about people who've been infected. Are they immune without getting the vaccine? We don't we're pretty sure they are, but we don't know that yet. So it's evolving science and things are going to change. They're going to keep changing and we're going to have to adapt. So I, I think that for a lot of people uh, that it might be hard to understand that while we're talking about vaccines, we still don't know whether that actually stops transmission. I wonder if you could just explain to the average punter What's going on here? Because when you say vaccines, one assumes that that actually stops transmission of the infection. But you're, you're saying actually it's not that simple. Yeah, so unfortunately vaccines aren't that simple. There's different kinds of vaccines that work in different ways, different effectiveness. So many of us think of a vaccine as sort of our, our childhood measles vaccine. Mm -hmm. You get your measles shot, you're immune for life, you'll never get the measles. Good to go, yeah. Yeah. There are other vaccines where, you know, they work maybe 60% of the time. They limit your ability to, to get sick, but they don't prevent you from getting sick altogether. So that's, you know, kind of the flu vaccine. Kind of works sometimes. And then this one, it's because it's so new. We just don't know. We make some assumptions. Immunity yeah. is usually long lasting, but not right. forever. So you can have a virus and not be that sick but still shed the virus so you can mm -hmm. be infectious. And that's mm -hmm. the part we don't know. And the only reason we don't know, know it is because it's become, it's come so, so quickly. There's some virus, there's some vaccines that took 20 years to develop. We've done this one in under a year. This yeah. is unprecedented science. Yeah. And as a result, there's just lots of unknowns, but there's some assumptions we can make. So I think some of the assumptions are it's gonna work pretty well, but we gotta figure out, and the more people we get it into, the more we can figure out how well it's gonna work.
Right. Um, but we're sort of building the ship on the fly. And this is, you know, a, as you said, uh, kind of a once in a lifetime pandemic. This, this is a big moment. Um, many, many people involved. Are you concerned about the risks at all of what might happen as the vaccine is rolled out? I think my biggest concern would be not safety. The safety data is pretty good. We have, you know, we've had vaccines for 300 years. We know how they work more or less. My biggest concern is efficacy more than anything else. Uh, it's quite possible that this won't last. So it may be like right. a flu vaccine where the, the virus mutates a little bit and we need to change it. So that's my biggest fear right. is it doesn't last. The other one is that it doesn't prevent pr transmission. Again, big, big unanswered question. Right. But we do know that it'll limit illness. So at the very least, and this is especially important in older people, it'll prevent that really severe disease where you end up on the ventilator and dying. Right. So even if we can make people a little less or a lot less sick, that's going to be a really important vaccine. Uh, is there a worry as um, people are vaccinated and they know that they, them, they are then themselves protected that they will be more cavalier about the other measures that will still need to be taken till we know for sure that transmission doesn't occur. So if we're kind of holding out for the vaccine to arrive, um, we get the vaccine and then we're like, oh, thank goodness, you know, I'm going to the restaurant now. I'm, I'm out to the bar. You know, I know I'm reasonably safe and, you know, you're still asking me to be a good citizen here, but, you know, I'm over it. I think, oh, I think that, we, yeah. yeah, I think that's definitely a concern that we let down our guard. Now, the people who are going to go out to restaurants are going to be lower down the list of the vaccine, right? But they might yeah. think, oh, if I'm not going to kill granny anymore, then I'm fine. Yeah. So I think it's going to be some really tough messaging to get across. Hang in there a little longer. Just hold off a bit. Right. Uh, maybe people will be able to go to restaurants, but we'll keep them socially distanced a, a lot more. Right. I, I think we're going to have to figure out compromises just to, practically because of the fatigue, because of the, the real desire to get back out there and, and do stuff. And, you know, we don't want to be perpetually negative. We have to give people these little glimmers of hope along the way. You're a nice person. Yeah, not a, an, an unusual thing for a journalist to say, but we do have to be hopeful. <laughs> uh, so thinking of, um, you know, optimistic things, and uh, we, uh, we were talking about um, finding the upside of the downside, finding the good things that have happened as a result of the pandemic, catching them, uh, and securing them and making them part of uh, a new day post-COVID. So we've already discussed uh, virtual care. Who knew, you know, decades and decades of telling us that it was not possible to do and then poof, it could in fact be done, it seems like in a week, um, that people were able to transition um, as they needed. What, what do you think are the elements of a better rebuild? So let's start with that first. Like what, what are, we, we've mentioned virtual care. Are there other pieces of this that are essentials? Like if you had to prioritize, I'm gonna ask you to prioritize. Prioritize yep. your list of, is that the top thing, virtual care? What, what's your top thing? And Oh, it's definitely not my top thing. So my top thing is, I think you look to where we failed the worst and that's mm -hmm. where the greatest hope is to fix things. Okay. So where did we fail? We failed elder care horribly. Yeah. So let's reimagine, let's not just build more long-term care homes. That I think would be the worst outcome. Let's rethink elder care from the bottom up. Right. Why are people in institutions that may put them at risk? Let's make putting people in the community number one priority. So that to me is top of the list. Uh, other things like that, you know, we did an amazing thing during the pandemic. We put homeless people in homes. We put them in empty hotels. Why do we have homeless people? I think it's really shone a spotlight on these failings of our social failings. So let's let's fix those things. Let's fix homelessness, homelessness, elder care. Then we can do more trivial things like like uh, digital care or right. you know virtual care. But there's a lot of things where we can really. Uh, take advantage of what we learned and do it differently, not just go back to the old ways of, oh, why should we throw people back on the street now because the pandemic's over? There's no, that makes no sense. Yes. So uh, looking at where we've failed um, and improving those 
fissures, those breakages in society, um, because hopefully we can't forget what has happened here, although we're awfully good at doing that. Um, I hope that that's correct, that we can seize on that. But as we also think about um, rebuilding society, an important part of society is obviously the economy uh, and um, wealth, as you know, is often goes along with, with good health. So how do we um, think about a, a positive rebuild of um, our economy? And I don't know if you want to link that to some of the other things you've been talking about, about the essentials. So what does that look like? So if you're you know, uh, advising the feds, and I'm sure they will assiduously read your columns, uh, or a province, what would you be telling them to, uh, that they should focus on? Again, I think you, I would tell them to look at the long term you know, the message here, you know, we've had this false dichotomy debate about oh, it's the economy or it's health yeah. all throughout. And I think the number one lesson of the pandemic is probably that uh, health is wealth, right? Without health, when there's a threat hanging over us all the time, we can't have a healthy economy. And we should take that attitude more broadly. Uh, you know, as long as we have 75,000 people a year dying of cancer, do we really have a healthy economy? So I think we can use this to have a different mindset to, to put health, uh, health in all policies, I think, mm -hmm. would be the ideal. Uh, there's going to be all kinds of pressures because of debt. You know, we have hundreds of billions of dollars in debt. There's going to be all kinds of pressures to cut. Oh, well, we have to cut welfare. We have to cut uh, medicine, et cetera, because we want to save money. And I think, I hope that we're not that short-sighted. I think we say, listen, we're going to have debt. We're going to have to pay that for a while, but we're going to spend it smartly as we rebuild. So I think if we start spending differently and more smartly, it'll benefit us all. But really put health at the center of everything. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't learned that lesson from the pandemic, I don't think you'll ever learn it. So I just might um, unpack that one a little bit. Uh, you know, the economy, health is the economy, economy is health. You did see some provinces and some jurisdictions um, basically protect the economy of using this kind of argument and perhaps not taking the precautionary measures that were needed um, on the basis that you know losing jobs or the economy declining is also bad for your health. Uh, so how do we square that circle? Because I think that was actually very problematic. I think, you know, you're saying something else, but that kind of discourse just taken too glibly can be used the wrong way as well, right? Yeah, but that, you know, that argument that was used, the, you know, we have to keep people working, et cetera, even if there's a virus spreading. I think that the jurisdictions that held to that, we're seeing them paying the price, right? Yeah. It, it ended up being a false argument. It ended up being short-term gain for long-term pain. And, and we know that, you know, countries like Australia, which really, you know, locked down for 111 days, they paid the price, they're flourishing now. And mm -hmm. that's, that's, I think, the message is you have to go all in on these things. You can't sort of be wishy-washy and say, well, they're going to keep businesses open and who cares if a few people get sick. Uh, those businesses are never going to be fully comfortable, right? You know, I have a lot of sympathy and we should be b helping out people in restaurants. But I think almost the worst thing for them is this half measure of, well, you're sort of open, but we are asking people not yeah. to go. That makes no sense to me. I think it would be much better to shut them down, give them money. Here's money for three months and nobody goes. That's it. Right. And, you know, we have to be more forceful about these things. Yes, it does seem to have been a problem with people assuming that things are safe because things are open, like gyms and so forth, when, um, you know, really they're not um, from, from all accounts and public health and epidemiology. So we've come to the sort of end of our, our tripartite <laughs> interrogation of you. Um, but we, wa we wanted to just le let you have um, a few last kind of thoughts before I go to some questions. So did, did you want to respond or reflect on anything that we've discussed so far or add anything that we haven't mentioned that you think we really should? 
Yeah, well, I'm mostly interested in hearing the audience questions, so I won't say too, too much, but I think, you know, you have to balance out this being hopeful because there's a vaccine coming, but just hanging in there a little longer. I know I've said it a few times, but I think it's worth reiterating. Uh, keep, our, keep our eye on the ball that this, this is a marathon and we're not quite sure where the finish line is, but we know that it's closer than, than it was yesterday. Yeah, I think that's the hard part for people is that the finish line keeps moving. And even in our discussion today with the advent of the vaccine, it's still going to be uh, measures will still be required and we need, you know, sophisticated and adroit kind of governance to, to get us there. But I think right. the good thing is that finish line is getting closer. We know that, that finish line is getting yeah. closer. Yeah, thank goodness. Um, so we do have some questions from some folks. Uh, and uh, is that OK if I, I go to those questions? OK. Um, so um, Jeffrey Gerd uh, is asking about uh, the media and <laughs> what, yeah, not to you, but uh, what, what is the responsibility of the media when reporting on health topics? Um, do you want to make some comments on, you know, the mixed messaging and how that's reported and how, you know, if you're in a cynical frame of mind, um, that, that can be quite difficult to convey that to the public without a certain amount of disdain. Yeah, so I think that you, first of all, you have to say the media is a broad spectrum, mm. right? So there's a lot of different media, but I work for a large newspaper. So what's, what's our role? I think our role is to inform people, to try and give them, you know, a fair summary of what's going on in the world, what's coming, yeah. et cetera, and to do it in a scientifically sound way. Are we perfect? Absolutely not. There's gonna be, you know, things that fail along the way, we won't get our message. You know, maybe our mask message was terrible at the outset, now it's better. But I, I often say that journalism is a lot like science and that it kind of is self-correcting over time. So I, I think the key though is to get, is we're in the business of information. Now, in public health, we often get criticized. We're not in the business of education. We're not in the business of educating people. We're giving them information. Often it's information they don't really want. It's ugly. It's, mm. you know, an uncomfortable truth, but yeah. that's a lot of what we have to do. Uh, and I think in health journalism in particular, we have to do some of that education almost by default. Mm. But I, I think one of the things we learned uh, at the Globe where I work, we have this COVID team. So we have a whole team of reporters and we meet every morning and we talk about what did we do well, what should we do next, etc. And one of the real things we learned is people want uh, something we call service journalism, things we don't, that we normally think is below us. So, wow, we don't do that stuff. Public yeah. health should answer questions, but they want us and they trust us to answer things like, where do I have to wear a mask? Where can I get my vaccine? So right. we've invested a lot of stuff in this real basic giving people info because I think information is comforting. Yeah. You know, that's what we've Empowering. clung on to uh, during the pandemic is I'm going to have a little bit of information and information's power. And I think that's given people the ability to get through it. So the, the media, I think, has become really, really important during the pandemic. Now, the paradox from a business perspective is essentially we give away our COVID content, right? It's not paywalled. Yeah. So uh, our newspaper is more popular than it's ever been, and it has less revenue than it's ever had. Right. So it's, it's not a sustainable model, but I think it's played an important role during the pandemic. Right. For, for you personally, um, this is me ad living on the question, but... Um, you know, you, you've played a very significant role. And I think early on in the pandemic, your call to shut down was uh, pivotal, actually, in governments moving faster than they might have otherwise done and an important um, message. But you could, I guess, have got it wrong. Um, you know, not that I think you would because you actually really know your staff. Do, do you find that... Um, kind, I mean, people have a lot of trust in you, but it also brings a lot of responsibility, you know. Um, do, you, do you feel that now? Because you've kind of gone beyond just commentating on what others are doing, but have almost become, you know, a, a public health um, decision maker, in a sense. People really listen to what you're saying. 
yeah, I hope they don't listen to me too much. But I think, you know, I think I, I, my role, I think of myself as a translator. So I think what I do is I try and summarize the, the information, you know, from scientists and public health and politicians and try and give people, here's a coherent message. Because those are very, there's a lot of cacophony there. They're not yeah. always clear messages. So I think my role is really to that, is to summarize and really say, listen, this is what they're trying to tell us. So that an example of the, the column you cited, when I said shut it down, that was what scientists were saying, but they weren't good at articulating it. They were saying yeah. it in these wishy-washy scientific ways. And my job is to just say, listen, here's what the public needs to know. Here's why we should shut down now and why. Mm -hmm. And at that time, there wasn't a single COVID death in Canada, right? So I got a lot of blowback, people saying, you're right. crazy. This makes no sense. Right. Now, could I have been wrong? Absolutely. But that's fine. It's not... Uh, it's not being about right or wrong. It's about giving the most clear message based on the, oh, no, the information at the time. Yes, I completely agree with you. But that does bring a, a level of responsibility and um, I would think a little bit of stress when you're doing these kinds of things. Well, yeah. I like to think that, I, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. I'd like to think I've been responsible for a long time. And, uh, you know, not much has changed for me, to be honest. I think I'm one of the pe few people in the country who I essentially do the same thing I did before. I often worked at home, et cetera. And very little has changed for me, except I get a lot more attention. So I, for often reasons that puzzle me. But, you know, I think uh, someone said early on in this, you've been training for this for 30 years, exactly. right? And I never thought about it that, but when they said that, I said, yeah, I guess that's right. And we might want to mention, of course, that your training started at the University of Ottawa. Of course, uh, <laughs> although I was a business student, so I, yeah, maybe no, I think, I, I think I it think, all goes in. I think yeah. some of my former Sh business uh, colleagues are, are angry at my saying shut things down, but right. there you go. So we have another question uh, from a colleague uh, who's an expert in, in long-term care and, uh, and home care, Ivy Bourgeau. Mm -hmm. uh, and she wants to know, um, a little bit following on from what we've already discussed, why, why, um, why did we not learn the lessons from the first wave and, uh, and the, the deaths and the suffering that happened in long-term care. Many of us were writing about it, you, me, Ivy, many others, about what needed to happen to prepare for the second wave. And yet it didn't, it seemed, occur, or at least not enough to prevent yet more carnage. Can you, um, is it the isms again, or is there more to this? Yeah, I think some of it is the isms, but I think a lot of it is uh, why did the things happen in the second wave the same as the first wave? And it's essentially because we didn't change the fundamental problems. So Dr. Bourgo, her expertise is in health human resources, and that's the fundamental problem, right? These uh, long-term care homes are chronically understaffed. People, There's just not the people there to deliver the care, uh, to deliver the safe care that was required. And she's written very eloquently about this. And we didn't fix it in those interim months. It's a problem that's existed for decades, and it couldn't be fixed overnight. Mm. Uh, there were jurisdictions like Quebec. Quebec vowed to hire 10,000 people. Uh, they tried. They gave it the old college try. About four or 5,000 of them ended up in the homes but in the interim, they lost uh, probably as many workers. So the situation is just as bad now. It's slightly different people, but we haven't resolved the fundamentals. And it's, you know, healthcare is all about people. And this failures during the pandemic were a failure to have the right people in the right place to care for, for the older people. As a, and as we said, mostly older women who needed care. Right. So it's, it's really a health human resource problem that should have been dealt with decades ago and it still has to be dealt with urgently now. Although some, even with the staffing in place, you know, going to the Kingston model, uh, you know, they were able to prevent those deaths happening with inspections and infection control measures. Do, do you think that maybe we sort of put a little bit too much our eggs all in the basket of just improve the people as opposed to improve the systems? Yeah, I think, I think it is the system is people. And I think what Kingston did is actually about people. They took their people who normally inspect restaurants that weren't open right. and they sent them to inspect nursing homes. Yeah. So that's, that's smart use of human resources, but it's ultimately about people. Uh, they did simple things like we're not going to have four people in a room. Now, a lot of homes just couldn't do that. Yes, they just didn't have the, there's an infrastructure issue, but I think it's secondary. Right. We have to fix the infrastructure, but 
the best infrastructure in the world without adequate staffing is not going to solve this. So we have another question about uh, from Lucie Ducellier about the uh, manufacturing of the vaccines. And the question is whether we should be, or what do you think about the fact that we weren't, uh, are not going to be the first country in the world to receive the vaccine? Have we done well enough um, on the procurement front, frontier, Andre? Did we do a good job there? Um, what's your assessment of this process? I, I think we actually have done a good job. We signed contracts with many companies. Uh, we're going to have vaccine. You know, not everybody can be first in the world. So right. I think we have to. I, I wrote about this in a column saying, you know, the, if people know the, the Lake Wobegon series, uh, that the joke there is everyone is above average. Yes. And you, you can't have that. Someone, you know, is not going to be first. And that's not the most important. The most important is we get it to people as soon as possible. So I think we've done a good job with what we have. Now, mm -hmm. then there's a broader question of should we have more uh, domestic vaccine manufacturing? And I think without question, we should. But again, that's an issue that goes back to decisions made 35 years ago that couldn't be corrected in the time that a vaccine was developed. So we had to deal with the cards that were dealt with us. And given those cards, I think we've done really well. There's going to be vaccines in the arm of, of Canadians on Monday. Mm. And we're going to be you know, among the first in the world. And that's not what's the most important. The most important is that they keep getting into people's arms right. for the next year. And yes. I think we, we're rolling this out slowly but surely, and I think it's, it's looking relatively good. Yeah. When we say slowly, it's actually been unprecedentedly fast, but yep. relative to the fact that we're, we're getting um, when we get the vaccine. So... The next uh, question is uh, from Anu Shukla Jones, and this is a question that we had touched on already a little bit, which is about coordination between different levels of government. Um, so she's asking um, again, how you know we've, we've touched on the fact that that hasn't happened. So let's maybe touch more on the go forward. How should it happen? How can we make this happen better? So. If God forbid we had another pandemic next year, that we have um, indigenous governments, governments, municipal governments, provincial governments, and the federal governments working together, um, how do we get that magic elixir? Yeah. Okay. It's again, you know, it's almost the how do we resolve Canada, right? You know, this weird confederation we have decentralized and it's really hurt us in, in during this pandemic. So I think the answer is not to have a, a federalized uh, system, you know, magic, we're not going to magically change the constitution overnight, right? We're stuck with the model we have, but I think it's just more about cooperation. And, you know, we uh, saw this in the SARS report, they talked about, you know, jurisdictions need to cooperate more, et cetera. But there has to be, I think, more forcefulness to it. So we have to have a public health agency, again, that's more independent, that has mm -hmm. more power, that uses a cudgel. So what's the cudgel that Ottawa has? It's money. Yes. So Ottawa has distributed a lot of money. My complaint, my constant complaint in healthcare is we don't put enough strings on the money and we don't hit hard when it's not respected. So I think the the, the the federal government has to be more of a bully, if I can put it that way. If you want money from us, you're going to do this. And they mm -hmm. have to sit down. Uh, the All the public health authorities in Canada got together every day on a conference call. There's no reason they shouldn't come out of that call with a coherent strategy. Not, they don't need 14. And the message from that, from public, from uh, the public health agency, should be either we have a coherent strategy, or one, this call doesn't end, and two, you're not going to get any money to do what you're doing unless you follow the, the lead. Right. So I, I think we just have to be more forceful about it and less sort of wishy-washy, polite Canadians. And, um, uh, uh, and so uh, uh, how do we deal then, you know, the part of what makes Canada Canada and why we have the disaggregated federation that we do is because of the particularities of, you know, culture, uh, location. Uh, so Indigenous government, governments have done, you know, they've done different things. They have closed their borders in, 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 in lots of ways. What, what, have, what do you make of how Indigenous governments have, have responded and how would that fit in more to this ethos of more strong-minded lead from the top? 
Well, I think, you know, you have strong-minded lead, but then you have to adjust to local yeah. circumstance. So there's particular challenges in uh, Indigenous communities, particularly remote uh, First Nations. I think we would have all done better had we, we followed their lead. They've done exceptionally well in protecting communities, uh, you know, places like Nunavut, uh, which, you know, held off the virus until November. Then when it had an outbreak, it really acted quickly and it's got it under control. Uh, if we had done like a lot of remote reserves in Northern Ontario did, uh, we wouldn't have these huge outbreaks in Toronto. So I think there's a lot of learning that could have been done. It's yeah. not all about top-down learning. It's about yeah. following, following the best examples. So, you know, saying that you have to more have more centralized agreement doesn't mean you say, oh, Indigenous people don't have a say. Quite the opposite. Right. Uh, but it's transparency about why things are different and yep. um, communicating that, going back to our earlier point. Well, you know what, we're, we're starting to run out of time um, and it's been just an amazing chance for me to have you all to myself. It feels like <laughs> it, even though you're out there as well. Um, what, one of the last questions we had is, you know, are you going to write a book? <laughs> uh, we know you've got a new book coming out about long-term care. Um, but are you going to write a book about um, everything to do with COVID-19 and some of our discussion? Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, that question came up early, you know, I, because I've written many books, I was approached by publishers and my answer was in March, the same it is this today is I don't want to write a book about COVID because I'm living it. I'm doing it on a daily basis. I think there's going to be many, many books about COVID. I think the best ones will probably be written in five or 10 years, you know, yeah, when we have retrospect. Kind of. So I'm, I'm looking forward for someone, not me, to write uh, the COVID version of The Great Influenza, one of my favorite books uh, about the, the influenza pandemic of 1918. So I decided I wanted to write about a consequence of the, the pandemic. And right. the consequence was the exposure of the failure of elder care. And I wanted to write something positive. I wanted to write about how can we resolve this fundamental societal problem of the mistreatment, the neglect of elders? So that what, that's what my book is about. It has a very short chapter on COVID, yeah. but it's really about how do we have more respect, uh, allow our elders to live in dignity and die in dignity. And that's, mm. I think, something we should all aspire to. We're all getting older, so there's a bit of selfishness in that book. But I yeah. think it's, there's nothing more important than, than respecting our elders. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm really looking forward to, to reading the book and um, we're going to wind up now and, and pass it back to the vice president for some closing remarks. But did you have any last thing that you wanted to add or say or tell, tell our alumni? No, I think I just wanted to mostly thank you for his pleasure chatting with you and uh, thank everyone for tuning in. And of course, uh, in a very unjournalistic fashion, I always like to end on a, on a hopeful note. And I think there is a lot of hope out there. We've uh, dealt with this pandemic much better than the, the last big one. You know, 50 million people died of, of influenza in 1918. A century later, we have much better medicine. We have better communication. Uh, we have better vaccines. We have better science. And it's paid off. This mm. could have been a much, much worse disaster. Right. And... Uh, the marathon has been long. It's been tiring. Yeah. As someone who runs marathons, I know there are parts where you want to give up, and we've all had those, but the end really is in sight now, and we should really be hanging on and doing those last little bits of sacrifice because we're all going to get there. So that, that would be my final hopeful message. I think that's a good uh, message to end on. So thank you so much, Andre, for this terrific event and conversation. Thank you to uh, the Alex Trebek family for um, making this possible and for all that he has done for us at the university. I've benefited from some of his largesse as well as my students have. So thank you so much. And now I'm going to pass it back to the vice president for a few uh, closing remarks. And thank you for listening. Andre, uh, Colleen, thank you so much. How I wish I could be there uh, with you today. What a thought-provoking discussion. I've learned so much. Um, and uh, I think everyone who dialed in today uh, has really benefited from this conversation. So my deep gratitude uh, to you both. Um, it is with great pride that we presented you the first virtual edition of our annual Alex Trebek Lecture Series. Uh, once again, please join me in acknowledging the positive impact that Mr. Trebek has had uh, and will continue to have 
through uh, these benefactions toward his alma mater and many other charitable organizations. Thank you to all of you at home for joining us this morning. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care.